Hi, if you could share Ben's screen, that would be great. Hi, Ben, if you hit it, get back to the beginning, that'd be brilliant. Here we go. Just that's a, a very quick drawing that I did for a project that I'm doing in London. Um, I, oh, have I don't been... know how to get off the screen. Sorry, guys. So, Ben, if you could go to the first slide, please. Just a very quick introduction. Um, I'm artistic director of an organization charity called Flow Observatorium, who was set up with the support of Arts Council to promote the um, recognition and equity for neurodivergent artists. I also wear other hats. So I'm a champion for mental health autism at Nottingham University. Um, and I support strongly the participation of autistic people in any autism research and for autistic people to govern and decide what needs researching. It's kind of the same in the arts. If you're talking about autistic artists, then you need to get autistic artists to talk. I'm also an artist, whatever that means. I've had a varied career, which I'll show you in a minute, but as important as anything else, I'm an autistic person too. Next one. So just a quick global warning. This talk and workshop may contain the following, all the things that an autistic person is not supposed to be able to do because they're stereotypes. So I will use metaphor, humor, sarcasm, empathy, irony, heresy, dissent and divergence. Next one. Just to start with, I'm gonna probably use um, identity first language. Um, I'm an autistic person, I'm not a person with autism. You know, I don't live with autism. I live with my wife and two cats. Thank you. Next one. So this is me. This is me when I was just about six and I was having my portrait done by a friend of my parents. It wasn't a paid thing. It was just having my portrait drawn. And the lady who was drawing me asked me what I wanted to do. And I said, I want to be an artist. And it wasn't because that's what she was doing. It's because that's what I felt inside. And at the age of six, you kind of don't know the ins and outs of that sort of thing. It just felt like the right thing to say. Next, please. So this is me, a little bit older with an ice cream, pretty happy. And this is from a project that I did in 2000 and and nine, 10, called In the Arms of My Loving Father. And it was about moments where things happen and you can't go back. So in that little photograph, I know exactly where I was. I know exactly how I felt. And then a little while later, I was started to have a very rough time at school. And the other little boy on that picture is the one they dropped on Nagasaki and you can't undo that at all. Next, please. So my time at school was not good. As well as being autistic, I'm neurodivergent in other ways. I'm dyslexic and synesthetic. Now I'll explain the dyslexia first. When I was at school, I couldn't write my name even during primary school, even when I was sort of 10, 11 in my last year, but I was good at drawing. I couldn't write things down, but I could remember things from pictures. So I called a bit of a SWOT in class. And, you know, the drawing kind of was my world. It was my passport to being looked on as a person. That might sound strange to say, but, you know, I went to school when dinosaurs ruled the earth in the late 60s and early 70s. And neither dyslexia or autism was spoken about in school. I was just called thick mainly most of the time, which was a bit unfair, thick or swat. And the teacher took a great delight in hurting me. So I drew a picture of a street, a Tudor street, and the headmaster came round, looked at it and said, oh, I like that, I'd like it up on the wall. And I thought I'd made it. And then my teacher asked me to put my name on it. And I had a choice like we all do in life. 
whether to ask for help. And I knew what he would say. He would say, well, can't even spell his own name. He'll be no good. Um, so I just guessed it, did it, handed it to him. He held it up in front of the class and tore it up and said, you'll never be anything because you can't even spell your own name. And that stopped me from going to art college 10 years, you know, eight, nine years later. I did an alternative, but this is a, this is actually my pen from school. And it's not that I don't like writing, and it's not that I don't like poetry or reading, all the traditional things that you're not supposed to be able to do as a dyslexic. I just find it tough. And to pick a pen up, whether that's to write something now or to write something then, this is how it feels. Next one, please. I draw. So when I left, left school, I, I, my degree and my university time was about geology and paleontology. I'm very interested in time. I feel time passing. I feel it synesthetically, but we'll come on to that in a minute. So it was natural to go and do geology. I have a very inquiring mind. I want to know what's above me, what's around me, history, time. So when I left university, um, I became the artist that I wanted to be, not till many years later, but I did start drawing. Uh, this was a drawing a portrait. It's one of the only portraits I've ever drawn. And I stopped after I finished the eyes. Next, please. Um, this is a little bit out of sequence, but it's important. I mentioned about synesthesia and Tony, will, one of the audience will know about this, what I did here. Synesthetic persons feel cross modalities of experience in their head. So I can smell something but see color. I can taste something and feel feelings or I can touch time. The most common synesthesia is seeing words in, in colors, um, but I don't because being dyslexic, I don't see words. Yellow is the most awful color for me. I uh, can't stand it. It makes me feel very frightened, very scared. And it's not like a code. It's not every yellow will do this. You know, synesthesia is not like that. Um, and this was a piece of artwork I went round sticking over the signs on the railway, um, ra railway stations where it says, please keep behind the yellow line until the train has stopped. There were two versions. There was pain and rain. Um, yep, I'm a very naughty, heretical person who likes putting things in public, but it's yellow, like the, the signs, and, you know, it just makes me feel unwell. Next, please. I was actually artist in resident for a rail company, and that mischievous, naughty behaviour of mine um, produced this. This is in the Southern Railway timetable from 2008 May timetable. and kind of working with one of the people um, at the, who, who did the timetables, um, I sneak this word in and it's in the margin, it's very small and I wanted to put it in there because I feel like I'm a marginalised artist and it's my dream and always has been my dream, like I said from six, to be the artist I wanted to be. Didn't go down too well, they printed 106,000 um, and someone commented, I think, I believe I was told, that it looked like a spelling mistake. So that made my day. Next, please. I've done some pretty odd things. Um, and this is one of those things. I was asked to document the disability arts in the southeast region for London 2012 and I said in one one condition and that I can turn it all into geological metaphor so for four and a bit years I wrote everything down I did every day and ended up with two million minutes worth of notes but those notes were written in geological format so they were diagrammatic and I put the whole lot together and I worked out things that were the same correlated it made a complete geological history and this is the resultant map so that's two million minutes of my life um, and it spawned a couple of other projects you know I always knew my geology training would come in useful 
And I think it's very important that artists draw on every and any part of their life. You know, actually, I don't know if I'm a scientist who likes drawing or an artist who likes science, but does that really matter? You know, often as autistic people as well, we like to do things, and I will say obsessively, but in reality, we like to do things well. And there's little difference between a six-year-old who starts finding fossils and wants to find more. Um, when you're 15 and, you know, it kind of rules your life and you go looking for fossils everywhere and do things really well, you're called obsessed. But at the age of 30, if you're a professor out the back of a museum, you're called an expert. You know, and a lot of people have had their interests, and I don't call them special interests, I hate that term. I call them intense interests. Um, and they, they use them as um, a catalyst for making art. There's several art science projects I've done. I made music from supernovas with a cosmology unit at one university, and I was luckily to be artist in resident at the Autism Research Centre in Cambridge too where I made music from supernova, um, from MRI machines and wrote a whole volume of poetry about my engagement with researchers. Next one, please. This is a photograph I took at the Royal Academy. I was lucky to work with this, this, um, this architecture and also the Royal Academy wanted me to join in with this festival. And because of my synesthesia, I sometimes see inanimate objects as people. So I have a rare synesthesia, personification synesthesia. And this chair I take everywhere with me sometimes. And it acts as an interface between myself and spaces I'm in. So I use it to gauge the room as it were. And this is one of the photographs from a day's festival at the Royal Academy. I took them beforehand and then made artwork live. Next one, please. Also with my synesthesia, I can see things that other people can't. So the world around me is full of shapes, feelings and objects and time that others cannot see. And this was for a brief project where I did a, a monument to the unseen autistic person. Um, because often as autistic people, we mask, we camouflage and to make ourselves average, to make ourselves normal, to make ourselves unobtrusible and un unseen, inobtrusive, so we don't get hurt. Because, you know, the bits that happen to me at school stay with you. And one thing we need to do is to change the way autistic, neurodivergent and disabled people are seen so the attitudes change, so we don't load up our next generations of kids with rucksacks of rocks that will weigh them down in their future. Especially at this time, you know, mental health is really important. Next one, please. I did a couple of projects for London 2012, one of which, and I like socially engaged artwork. I like working with people. Now you might think, well, that goes against the stereotype of an autistic person who doesn't like people and wants to stay indoors every day. Well, there you go. It's a stereotype, so it's not true. I like seeing the reactions of people. I once walked into Pallant House. This is probably giving the game away. I like Pallant House. I've done a fair bit of work with them as an outsider artist. And I had a show in there which showed the, the a mapping project, which led to something else, which led to something else. And I like leaving things places. So I walked in there and I put a book on the floor in one of the, the galleries and I put um, tape around it and some cones. And I just heard this old lady walk over and look at it and say, oh, this must be modern art then. I also put a load of printed words swept under their carpet and I don't know whether they found them yet. But an artist should be um, cheeky, an artist should be raw, an artist should challenge. Now this was for a project where I was commissioned by Parliament to lead on the social engagement for the Magna Carta celebrations and it was a digital project where we worked with um, the ar archives and the, the portrait gallery etc. Now it was commissioned by Parliament not government. There's a big difference there. Um, use your vote. And we got we, we had a website app where people could, you know, tune into exactly where they were and find out 
who the streets around them were named after. And this is my favorite from the whole project. People sent in, you know, who they had found, they could make, draw, do whatever they wished um, with the information, because if you know your surroundings better, you know, it makes you feel easier and your community, etc. This is William Owen Drive. There's only one, one uh, William Owen Drive in the country. And yes, it's named after Wilfred Owen, um, who, funny enough, my grandfather fought in a battle about four miles away when he was, when Wilfred Owen was killed. Um, so we did a series of posters celebrating people who had made a difference. And it's really important that you think that as a, an individual, you can make a difference. You know, you have a vote, use it. Um, you might think, well, everybody else will vote against me, but still use it because you don't know. And artists, I believe, should make a social difference. If you look back to Victorian times, you've got Charles Kingsley writing The Water Babies that directly influenced Parliament and they changed the law. I'm not sure how true that will be at the moment because of what's going on, but next, next one, please. As well as drawing, as well as video, as well as music, I do digital art too. This is a one from last year. It's one of Dis Disability Arts Online COVID commissions where I got people to take a photograph, an ordinary photograph in their house, and I changed it and made it like a geological cross section. So this is one of those. I like transforming things. And autistic people tend to be good at transforming things. You know, if you give me a blank sheet of paper, and ask me to draw something, it'll, I will switch off because there's too much possibility. Give me a subject, a keyword, a trigger, and I can draw. Next one, please. This is actually a letter from my granddad, um, one um, to my mum on the, the date of my birth. But the more important one is the other one. This is a letter to my granddad from his father. And sometimes you keep these objects that mean something and are special to you. At the time my grandfather received this letter, he was fighting for his life in a huge battle in 1918. Um, and I do suffer from PTSD myself. And he, I recognize now sitting with him, that look in his eye, and I just wish I could go back and tell him it's all right. Next, please. And this is him. This is him uh, before the war, and this is him after war with his wound stripe and his long service badge. And you can see the difference in the look in his eye even within one year. And I use, you know, I use science as a trigger for my artwork. I use literacy, I use nature, but I also use family history. Um, you know, we tend to, to know exactly uh, what we need. Next one, please. Just the last couple. In the last year or so, um, I've been working on a project you can find on Twitter uh, called COVID Corvids. Um, I like Corvid birds, feathered dinosaurs, wonderful things. I actually got told off once I fed one, I fed a rook uh, at a cafe and one of the waiters came out and said, excuse me, please don't feed the crows. And I said, they're not crows, they're rooks, which was a kind of a very autistic answer, but there we go. Next, please. Now, this is a project. This is called the, uh, the uh, imposter. I do suffer from imposter syndrome, uh, partly because of my time at school. And this is for a project in East London uh, called Trellis, run by the University College London, working with autistic poets. And I was making artwork from some of the things they say. So again, I'm using the metaphor. I'm turning all the examples into these feathered dinosaur stroke COVID birds. Uh, next one, please. Sometimes I use drawing to express how I feel. And when you live with PTSD, your head is full and you can't breathe and move. And hence the crow in this. Next one, please. And the last image to show you is, is a project that, um, when I first got PTSD, I didn't leave the house for three months. Um, that kind of sounds like now again, doesn't it really? Um, 
it's strange when this all started and we went into lockdown I felt like people were catching up with my world where you're frightened of things you don't see um, and I went to a gallery opening and I bumped into someone who'd worked with me on a previous project and they said what are you doing now and I said well I've been working on performing and plays and they said would you write me a performance on crossing boundaries so I wrote this arc, uh, um, family history stroke, living with PTSD. You know, you're on the border, you're on the boundary between the land and the sea, between life and death, all those. You feel like King Canute, you, you know, holding your hand out and saying stop, but it doesn't. So I wrote this performance and it's kind of become a staple in the last couple of years called Games with the Water Horse. The water horse being the hippocampus in your head and also that mythical animal that comes out of the water and drowns you, beguiles you, drowns you. And I first performed that in, actually in front of one of the people here uh, in Venice for uh, Venice Agendas and then at um, Turner Contemporary. And now I perform it once or twice a year, except last year, where I wasn't, haven't been allowed out. But we use everything we can to create and make artwork from. So I'm just gonna leave you with a short poem. So next one, please. So, you know, I've, I've said all the way through that I'm autistic um, and, you know, I'm not the word or the letters or the spaces in between or the person in your imagination you think I should have been. I'm simply human. I'm simply an artist. Next one, please. Page intentionally left blank. Always laugh at that in books because it's not blank, is it? Thank you. <laughs>